we'll move further down southwest along the parade route and we'll learn about a group that was standing in front of the steaming cup, spectators again. Innocent people have nothing to do with anything. You're going to hear about three kids who were standing al along with a bunch of others along the curb in front of steaming cup and as the defendant swerved from the left side of the street as he hit Jane back to the right side of the street as he was avoiding the vehicle that was ahead of him, clipped the curb and hit these three kids. Then we're going to move in to the next group in the parade route, which is the dancing grannies. This is the deadliest point in the parade. Seven people in this group were struck. Four of them died. You're going to hear from witnesses, uh, members of the Dancing Grannies group, who will come in and they will describe being completely caught off guard. They will describe seeing pom-poms in the air. And the next thing they knew, there were bodies on the ground before the pom-poms hit the ground. You will learn about Bill Hospital who was walk, marching in a support capacity. He was there to support his wife Lola and their friends, the rest of the dancing grannies, just walking along the parade route trying to be helpful. And as the defendant swerved around the dancing grannies vehicle, which is a white SUV, you'll see it in the vid video, swerved around the right side, he hits Bill. And the medical examiner is going to tell you that Bill Hospital cause of death was multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. You'll learn about Tamara Durand marching with the grannies. This is her first parade. You'll see a diagram of where she was positioned. You'll see video of her getting struck. The medical examiner will tell you that Tamara Durand cause of death multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. You'll hear about Lee Owen, another dancing granny positioned right next to Lee, excuse me, right next to Tamara, who had just begun one of her favorite routines, walking in a winter wonderland when she got hit. You'll learn about Jenny Sorensen. You'll learn that Jenny was walking at the front of the group carrying the banner. You'll learn that Ginny was normally a coach for the group. Normally she rode in the vehicle in the back so that she could provide feedback and critique to her dance mates. But she filled in at the last moment today to help carry the banner. You'll see video of Ginny getting struck. Medical examiner will tell you that Ginny Sorensen's cause of death was multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. You'll hear more speed analysis, test analysis testimony at this point. You're going to hear from Mike Smith with the Wisconsin State Patrol, who's going to testify very similarly to how Detective Carpenter is going to testify about speed analysis. Basically, he takes surveillance video, this time from Curry Insurance, which is on the south side of Main Street. It shows the grannies getting struck. They measure point to point and <coughs> measure the time between those two points and calculate an average speed over that distance, which is roughly from Clinton Street up until the camera cuts out. They'll tell you that at that point where the defendant crashed through the Dancing Grannies group, he was traveling at approximately 32 miles an hour. The eighth and final group that was struck by the defendant in this case is the Catholic Communities of Waukesha. This is a faith-based organization. It consists of members of multiple local Catholic churches who got together that Sunday afternoon to spread a little Christmas cheer. There is not great video, and perhaps that's for the best, of this group getting struck. In total, there were 19 victims in this group. In what little you can see from the video, you can see the defendant's taillights swerving from the left side of the street to the right, you can see them bouncing up and down. There are no speed bumps in that section of the road. 
The next phase of the evidence will involve uh, the manhunt. How authorities found the defendant, took him into custody, and the statements he made after he was placed under arrest. You will hear from Officer Bryce Skolton, who was positioned, if you look at this third of the three maps I referenced, uh, on the very top of this map at the intersection of Main Street and Wisconsin. Officer Skolton was positioned at that point to direct the parade route to make a left-hand turn from Main Street onto Wisconsin to stop any traffic coming from the other directions. He saw the defendant come around that corner. He saw the defendant drive right at him as he's standing in the middle of the road. And as the defendant went around him to the left and went south, Officer Skolton fired three rounds from his service weapon. All three rounds hit the car. None of them hit the defendant. You will hear from uh, another police officer who was not on duty that day. He just happens to be a police officer. His name is Officer Ralph Salyers. He's from the Wauwatosa Police Department. If you take a look at that map, he's going to describe to you being uh, on the sidewalk, leaving the parade. He was walking past Les Paul Middle School. He's going to describe hearing a loud commotion. He's going to describe <laughs> seeing a red SUV with just utterly total front end damage coming to rest uh, in a driveway at 338 Maple Avenue. You're going to see video of the defendant in the red SUV pulling into the alley behind 338 Maple and then a few moments later you'll see what appears to be the defendant coming back onto the screen and running away from the vehicle, apparently in a hurry, apparently aware that he had done something terribly wrong. You're going to hear from a series of witnesses between that point and the defendant's arrest where they will describe the defendant approaching them, contacting them, asking them to use their phone because he was in such a rush when he ditched his SUV, he left his phones behind. Then you're going to hear from Daniel Ryder, and I think the evidence will show Daniel Ryder really is a good embodiment of the spirit of Waukesha. Not knowing what Mr. Brooks had done, Daniel Ryder opened his home to the defendant. The defendant showed up at his front door without any shoes on, with a t-shirt, said he was cold, said he needed to use the phone. Daniel Ryder let him inside, gave him a sandwich, let him use the phone, and then gave him a coat. And a few minutes later, the police showed up. You're going to see body cam video of that arrest. You're going to hear from Officer Rebecca Carpenter that she responded to that area of, around where Daniel Ryder lives because of reports of a man knocking on doors. She takes him into custody. He identifies himself on the body cam video. They search him, and in his pocket they find a red, excuse me, a key to the red Ford Escape used in this attack. You're going to hear from a series of officers who retraced the defendant's steps that night, recovered surveillance video showing the path that he took, the path that's depicted here in the third map that I'm showing you. You're going to hear how they recovered his sandal, his sweatshirt, along the, the escape route. You're going to hear from Detective Jay Carpenter with the City of Waukesha Police Department, and he's going to talk to you about the defendant's statements after he was taken into custody. I'm going to let that interview speak for itself other than pointing out for you that you will, I think, quickly learn a few main points about the defendant on the night that this happened. He was lucid. He was aware. He was intelligent. He was probing for information. And he was deceptive. We're going to then wrap up with testimony from people who plugged any of the remaining holes in the investigation. You'll hear from crime lab analysts, about DNA evidence, about finding the defendant's DNA on the steering wheel of the Red Ford Escape. You're going to hear from Wisconsin State Patrol Inspector Ryan Schultz. He's going to testify about the mechanical inspection that he did on this vehicle. In case you were wondering if there were any issues that would have prevented Mr. Brooks from stopping or from pulling over, 
He's going to quickly put those concerns to bed. He conducted that mechanical inspection. No problem with the brakes. The accelerator didn't stick. There were no mechanical problems that would have prevented Mr. Brooks from stopping. Finally, we're going to close our presentation of the evidence, not with a witness, but with an experience for you. You are going to go to a secure location, and you're going to have a chance to see the murder weapon with your own eyes. You'll be able to see that red Ford Escape. I want to close now with a few points about how the evidence relates to the law in this case. There are, obviously, we've gone through the six counts of first-degree intentional homicide, but in addition to those homicide counts, there are six counts of hit and run involving death. Those are separate charges. The evidence will support convictions on all of them, all 12 counts of homicide, but they involve the same six victims. Another point I want to bring to your attention is that for each count of first-degree intentional homicide and each count of first-degree recklessly endangering safety, if you find the defendant guilty of any of those counts, you have to answer a second question. Did he commit that crime while using a dangerous weapon? And here the evidence will show that he didn't use a gun or a knife to commit these crimes. He used 3,500 pounds of steel, rubber, and glass. The defendant's also charged with two counts of felony bail jumping. You'll hear evidence uh, to support those charges, which includes the fact that the defendant was charged with a felony offense in a case in Milwaukee County and released from custody subject to conditions of bail. And then he was charged with another felony offense in a separate case in Milwaukee County and released from custody subject to conditions of bail. And those conditions of bail included requirements that he not commit any new crime. And those conditions of bail were in effect on November 21st of 2021. We have dozens of video clips to show you. You're going to have notebooks and writing utensils while we present this evidence to you. It's a lot to keep track of. And when you go back into the deliberation room, it might be difficult while you're deliberating to remember which video was about which victim or which incident or which group. And so my suggestion to you is that as we go through these videos, you're free to do whatever you want with your notes, but my suggestion would be as we go through these videos, they each will be labeled with an exhibit number. And so I recommend that you keep track of which exhibit number corresponds with which video. That way, while you're deliberating, if you want to see those videos again, you can ask for them by exhibit number. I can't guarantee that you'll be able to see any or all of them, but you can ask. I'm done now. I want to close on one final point, and that is, on behalf of the state of Wisconsin, I want to say thank you. We work your serving in what is the greatest criminal justice system in the history of the world, and that's because of the 16 of you. It's because a group of citizens, randomly selected, come in and make the final, ultimate determination between guilty and not guilty. That's unique in this world. It's special. And so we're going to go through this evidence. We're going to be mindful of your time. We know how valuable it is. We're going to be efficient, but we have a lot to get through. A lot. And at the conclusion of all that evidence, District Attorney Opper is going to stand up here and she's going to ask you to render verdicts consistent with the evidence, to find the defendant guilty of each and every count. Thank you.